rising up, get ready, I'm not gonna take no more. There's a revolution, a revelation going on in my soul. Buckle up. Welcome to another edition of the Live from the Heartland show. I'm Michael James, and we want to thank Kev Moe for bringing us in with Stand Up and Be Strong. We're out of Chicago, and we do stand up and be strong as often as we can. Uh, Welcome to this edition of the Live from the Heartland show. This is number 95 in the year of, of the pandemic since we started doing it at home via Zoom. And I got to say, it's nice and comfy in here. It's uh, Sometimes the sun comes in and it's a little bright, get a little reflection off my forehead from the lighting. Um, but I, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, sharing a little bit of information with you today, and we have some really uh, fun guests. We're gonna have an old friend, uh, longtime friend, Thorn Dreyer out of Austin, Texas. And he's gonna talk to us about a couple of uh, things he's doing besides doing the RAG blog. He's got a book out with other people called Exploring Space City. And it's a history of an underground paper in Houston. Uh, and uh, that'll be fun talking about that. We'll do talk about a bunch of other things. And then we're going to have a couple of musicians out of Chicago. We're going to have Gerald McClendon, uh, the blues keeper, and we're going to have his partner in crime, so to speak, um, Vince Salerno. And uh, I want to take that back. I know these guys are upstanding citizens. I don't mean partner in crime. Um, so let's get going. Uh, we'd like to start off with a couple of uh, fun things that have been happening. And uh, uh, I'm here... Uh, you don't see him, but he's here. It's Emilio Davis. He is uh, the engineer and producer, and he came up with this one. Um, the Baltimore, Baltimore Museum of Art has a new exhibit curated entirely by its security staff. Guarding the Art is a special exhibition at the Baltimore Museum of Art, where the 17 security staff employees selected each piece, designed the lighting scheme, and wrote all the placards. With over 90,000 pieces archived and only 1,700 on display at any time, it's no surprise those who spend their time guarding the art did an excellent job creating a compelling exhibit. And uh, close to Baltimore, let's go to DC. Uh, I don't know if anyone saw this, but there, uh, there's a guy on a bicycle, a 76 pound bike named Daniel Adler, who um, heard all the noise from the so-called Freedom Convoy that had gone to Washington with truckers protesting uh, mask mandates and any kind of, and a lot of conservative uh, issues. And uh, he didn't know what was going on, but he heard the horns honking and he went out there with his bike. And some of you may go back to Tiananmen Square and remember in China when, uh, uh, all that activity was happening, happening in Tiananmen Square, and one person stopped uh, a tank. This was kind of similar to that. He rode very slowly uh, with a bunch of these truckers complaining that he was in the way, but he slowed the whole thing up. And uh, I think, you know, some people have Gotham has Batman, other cities have other things, DC has Bike Man. So, congratulations to Daniel Adler for taking a little bit of action. Um, on the political front, uh, we, we talk a lot about voter suppression uh, on this show and try to come up with things. We know that uh, no matter which side of the political divide you're on, uh, there is a lot of redistricting that has happened off of the most recent census. And in New York, uh, the Democrats uh, really seem to have scored a big victory, picking up a few more seats, but a Republican judge has uh, blocked the situation. So these new drawn districts in New York have hit a roadblock. Um, we still have issues in North Carolina. We had issues in Alabama. Uh, we'll have a, a really fair way to draw up our political maps, but that seems to be a ways off. Um, on the COVID front, uh, on Tuesday, the CDC announced recommendations for certain immune comp immunocompromised people over the age of 50 to receive an additional uh, booster shot at at least four months after their first booster as extra protection against COVID. Um, well, I had my booster shot and I'm about four months out and I'm gonna do it. 
I also want to say that uh, I've been out in the world. I went out, I was at the Department of Motor Vehicles um, recently. I um, been out in the world. I see some people with masks. I see others without. I'm going to continue to wear a mask when I go into places where there are a lot of people. Okay, that's just what I'm going to do. And you can do what you want. But I think in the interest of humanity, it's best to be on the side of caution around this because despite everyone's desire and efforts to get back to normal, so to speak, uh, whatever that would be, um, this uh, virus is still a real challenge to the collective health of the people on the planet. And we need to do whatever we can to uh, bring it to some kind of a closure. Okay, on the energy front, well, I'm just going to put uh, Chernobyl in the energy section here. Uh, Russian forces are moving away from the Chernobyl plant, where the younger people may not remember there was a big nuclear disaster, and it's really a dead zone, but it's still a plant that does uh, pump out some electricity. So the Russian forces, having been bogged down and digging bunkers in contaminated soil, uh, a lot of people got sick, and uh, apparently the Russian troops are moving away from that occupation. However, NATO Secretary General said Moscow is bringing in troops from Georgia to double down on their attacks in eastern Ukraine. Um, on the labor front, uh, we just got this as 48,000 workers at Kroger-owned grocery stores prepare to strike. Kroger subsidiary Ralph's has begun a campaign to, I'm not sure where Ralph's is, but it's a, it's a Kroger's kind of store somewhere in the country. Uh, they've begun to recruit scabs to replace the striking workers. Um, but in an effort to stifle Kroger's union busting activity, a fellow named Sean Black, he's an amateur computer coder and popular creator on the TikTok app. I may have seen this stuff because TikTok talk was this, does suck you in. He made a video demonstrating a computer script, which he coded to submit bogus applications to Ralph's scab recruitment website in order to flood the site and wreak havoc for the company's hiring process. Black claims that the tool has submitted over 23,500 bogus applications already. It stated that he just wanted to do his part the way, the best way he knows how. Well, that was pretty creative and uh, we'll see how that goes. Um, on the front, Illinois governor's race, uh, if you watch regular TV, and I confess to watching uh, sports and news a good amount of time, um, you'll see the guy who, uh, billionaire Ken Griffith, uh, the conservative Republican guy in Illinois, he's backing uh, the mayor of Aurora. And uh, the mayor of Aurora, you know, makes out like he's a black guy who's a Republican, the worst nightmare for liberal Democrats. Uh, but I saw an ad yesterday, probably from Pritzker, our current governor, who we do like, who uh, basically pointed out that Irving had been uh, as a lawyer before he was the mayor, mayor in Aurora, had taken all kind of uh, criminal cases. Uh, he made his money and his his rep and got to where he was off of protecting uh, a lot of criminals, including um, some child pornography. Uh, so I'm watching these ads. Uh, we've got till November till the race, uh, but uh, it's getting interesting. Okay, so you are listening to the Live from the Heartland show. This is the show, the number 95 at home for the week of April 2nd in the year 2022. Um, it will be uh, on air tomorrow. That will be Saturday on WLUW.org, 9 to 10, and then it goes to YouTube.com. Uh, we're going to bring on our first guest in a minute. That's Thorn Dreyer. Uh, but uh, I thought a good way to bring him in, besides wearing my Beto for Texas shirt, uh, would be to play a little bit of music uh, out of Texas. And there were obviously a lot of choices. I was thinking Lightning Hopkins, and I was thinking Freddie King. And then I remembered the first time I was in Austin, Texas, was uh, at a place called the Vulcan Gas Company. And it was a rock and roll show. I was probably of altered consciousness. And there was a band called Sheba's Headband. 
So we're going to hear a little bit from Shiva's headband, Take Me to the Mountain. And we'll be right back with more live from the heartland. Stay tuned. Michael James here, about to bring on Thorn Dryer. Going to listen to Shiva's headband, Take Me to the Mountain. Now in all this land, folks and trees, I did ever see. No, it was like my own reflection by the sand. Hey, we're back with more live from the heartland, and I'm here with my old pal Thorn Dreyer out of Austin, Texas. Good morning to you, Thorn. Good morning, Michael so James. We just, we <laughs> it's were, so good we, to see you. It's good to see you. The last time we saw each other was 2013 down there at South by Southwest. Um, at one of your friends' houses, I think we saw each other. There was a party, but also my son's band, Twin Peaks, was playing. And uh, we had a good time down there. Yeah, Jim Rutherford's house. Right Sounds on, good. right on. Say hi to Jim for us. I'm well, I, uh, since we uh, do this show by Zoom these days, uh, it's great that we can. Uh, we didn't have to bring you into the studio. And I did, in your honor, besides playing Sheba's headband, uh, Take Me to the Mountain, I uh, put on my Beto shirt. And uh, <laughs> he's running for Texas. And I'll ask you about that maybe later on. Okay. But uh, one of the things that uh, you do and people should know about is you uh, have a wonderful radio show every Friday at two o'clock central time uh, called The Rag Radio, and it's on KOOP. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your show and how you've kept it going all these years? Okay, it's Rag Radio, and we're on a, we're on a community radio station uh, that... Uh, um, is listener supported and also is uh, cooperatively run. And that's to my knowledge, the only radio station in the country that's cooperatively run. We know of no other. So it's, and I've been doing it for, this is my 13th year to do the show. And um, it's, it's just a, a whole lot of fun. A lot of what we do is old people, 60s stuff, uh, uh, you know, but, but not, not at all exclusively. We do all kinds of things. We do musicians. Um, we do. We have um, generally hour-long, in-depth interviews. So, it's, it's well, I, I enjoy it immensely. Yeah, I, I listened uh, last week. I'm not sure their names, but it was the most detailed uh, report on what's going on in Ukraine that I've I've heard yet. Yes. And uh, I would like to alert uh, the listeners to live from the heartland and the viewers too that. You have invited me to be on your show again. That's I was right. only on very briefly once, but now I got to prepare because you, you want me there for an hour next Wednesday for broadcast the following Friday week from today. Right. That is absolutely true. <laughs> so I hope, hope I do the right thing for you when I come on. Oh, I'm uh, sure you will. Let's talk a little history. Let's go you back. You have a little uh, experience in the area yourself. So. <laughs> Let's talk, uh, you know, uh, I, uh, as I said to the listeners and the viewers already that I, the first time I remember being in Austin, I think the first time I was, ever was, was some SDS event. Uh, I went to see Shiva's headband. Uh, a little bit later on, you guys started a newspaper called uh, The Rag. And uh, tell us about uh, the, the scene at the University of Texas back in the day. I mean, you had the music like at the, the Vulcan Gas Company. You had the SDS chapter. Uh, you also had a, a big shooting. Uh, tell us a little bit about those early days. Right. Well, first, we had a massive countercultural community in Austin. It was very, very big. And one of the things that the RAG did, the RAG was, was an underground newspaper that was one of the very first. It was like the sixth underground newspaper. And it was the first one really to pull together the political and and countercultural communities and make them into a kind of a, a political force. So that was very, that was, that was very important. Shiva's headband uh, were my friends. Uh, they were a remarkable band. And uh, it was kind of like, um, I don't know, psychedelic blues. I don't know how you could describe With Shiva's a bunch head. of armadillos jumping around. Right, right. But they, yeah. Jim Franklin was the, uh, was often the MC at the, at the, uh, at the um, Armadillo World Headquarters, and he would wear a, a big armadillo helmet 
when he was the MC and stuff. But he's the he's the famous artist who did the did the, all of the armadillos that uh, jumping over the seen, highway, jumping over the highway, yeah, and Freddie King's album and lots of stuff. So. <laughs> But uh, um, they were my friends. They were my personal friends. Kenny Parker, who was the bass player who died a few years ago, uh, was, um, I went to elementary school with him. And uh, so we came up, we all came up together along with Dennis and Judy Fitzgerald, who were two of the editors of, of The Rag. And so we all came up to Austin together. And so I knew, and Susan Perskin, who sang for that band, also Susan Armstrong, when I knew her, was also, I went to high school with. So they were great. They were a wonderful band. I loved them, and they did more benefits uh, for for good causes than anybody I know of. They were terrific. They're still they still show they still still do shows. How about the early SDS activity out there? Well, SDS started out as it did so many other places. I joined in '63. Um, we I remember we had a we had a um, a sit in at LBJ's ranch. Um, and I can't remember the occasion, but it was one of the moratoriums or something. I don't remember. Uh, and we had maybe a dozen people sitting in. You know, it wasn't that long before we had 20, 30,000 people marching through the streets. So, I mean, it was a while, but, it, but so it, it grew, it grew very fast. It asked, Austin SDS was part of what was known as, as the, uh, the, the prairie movement, I guess, or the, it was a little more anarchistic, uh, a little more tend towards the counterculture, but very political. And um, it was, uh, uh, there were some great, there were a lot of people who became leaders of SDS, in fact. Uh, Robert Pardon, Jeff Shero, Nightbird, um, yeah. uh, a lot of people like that. So, but it was fun. It was great. It was around the campus, uh, basically focused around the campus. And it was a big, big, big school. And um, so we did things like General Thursday, uh, which we which was a, an event that we did that ended up repeating several times over the next few years, uh, where uh, we just told everybody we just sort of took over the campus, and everybody brought their guitars and brought their babies and and everything, and it sort of broke down a whole lot of barriers. It was considered to be a major a major event in terms of breaking down barriers between the jocks and the and the hippies and, the, and whatever categories. And the university finally banned it uh, because there, there were posters saying, you know, kiss your girlfriend and stuff like that, which they didn't like. But uh, so the next year we, when we had it, it was just a ma it was massive. After they banned it, it just became massive. <laughs> and that right. next year we had, we had Stokely Carmichael and Allen Ginsberg and all kinds of people there. So. So there was a, a ser pretty serious shooting there from a tower. Was that that was around the same time? Can you tell, remind me what what happened? Was it directed at the radicals and the hippies? Or no, no, it was it, Charles Whitman was the shooter, and it was it was the first of its kind of that kind of mass shooting. He shot from the top of the university tower, and he just started taking aim at people that he could hit. And he was a he was an uh, eagle. He was an eagle scout. And I can't remember if he had been in the military or not, but he was a sharp eye shooter. And so he just started mowing people down. And uh, there, was no, there was no known reason. Some people thought he had a brain tumor or something, but it was, there was no known, known reason for it. And, but it was a big, big deal. Uh, and uh, in fact, I know two people who were in SDS who were good friends of mine were shot yeah, one, one of them lost. One of them moved to Chicago, as I recall. Well, one of them, Claire Wilson, uh, was uh, her, she lost her unborn baby, and I don't remember if she moved or and Sandra Wilson was the other one, and I don't know who moved to Chicago. I'm not sure. I don't know, someone was around for a while, but then no, after no. all this is going on down in there in Texas, you moving over to another part of Texas, you went to Houston. Well, you Houston's my up. hometown, by the way. Right, you grew up there, and you uh, you started uh, with a number of other people. Some of them had been involved with the rag. You started uh, Space City with an exclamation point. And, That's uh, right. Let's give an introduction to it from our friend A. Peck. It says, pushing past bombings and clan attacks, Space City ranks among the best reported and fondly remembered underground papers of the 60s and early 70s, and this book does a fine job of explaining why. 
Tell us about the book, Thorne. I've been looking at it for days. Uh, it's got a lot of uh, stuff that overlaps with stuff going on everywhere in the country. Uh, some stuff unique. Tell us about Houston, the neighborhood okay. it came out of and how you put it together. First, I'll mention that we did a book on the rag uh, in 2016 called Celebrating the Rag, which was in, so they were sort of companion books in a way. This one's longer and more intensive. Uh, but the rag book sold about a thousand copies, which was, which is a lot <laughs> for yeah. anybody to sell these days, but that partly it was because there was such a big rag community. Um, but the, the book Exploring Space City, um, it's, we moved back a, a number of us, well, three of us were from Houston in the first place and had been involved in the rag. We moved back and then a couple of people joined us, including Victoria Smith, Vicki Smith, who I worked with at Liberation News Service. And, uh, and um, she and I were sort of partners. And so we all moved back. We started the paper. It was a very, very different kind of paper than for instance, the rag, which was in a big countercultural community. Houston was a, an adolescent boom town. Uh, you know, it was, it, was, it was in many ways a very progressive town, but on the other hand, the Ku Klux Klan ran rampant, ran riot. Uh, and, uh, and after us, they were shot up our offices, they bombed our offices, uh, they, sh they uh, shot at people sitting in front of the office, they, they bombed, they uh, shot up our advertisers, uh, so they, and they bombed the Pacifica radio uh, uh, tower, the uh, transmitter, which was the only radio station in the country to ever be bombed off the air. So we've got a lot of firsts, you know, it's Texas. Wow. And so, um, so we had, we did it with the, we had the Klan after us all the time. Um, the Klan had their own underground newspaper called the Rat Sheet. And they even did a special edition called, f dedicated to the infamous Dryer Rats. My, uh, my mother was, an, was an, a, a pretty famous Houston artist and my father was a, a, a writer and a newspaper man. And they had an art gallery and they showed black artists and they also, were very much involved in the anti-war movement and in uh, uh, sort of humanist politics. And so uh, the Klan shot up the gap, my mother's gallery. <laughs> wow. and, uh, um, and, and so anyway, it was, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a fascinating time. Uh, but, we, the, but Space City was different from lots of other underground newspapers. It had a lot of power structure research. It did a lot of sort of, um, um, uh, advocacy journalism uh, that was that was pretty in depth, um, and lots and lots of cultural coverage. You know, big features on Janis Joplin and Muhammad Ali and 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 uh, and more. Uh, but it also covered what was a, a really growing a sort of rainbow coalition in Houston, uh, the People's Party too, which was a uh, a black organization that was based on the Black Panthers, they had the same, the same uh, uh, basic uh, platform same programs. And, yeah. yeah, everything. It's just that the, the, at that point, the Panthers didn't want to add any more chapters. And so that's why they didn't. But, but Carl Hampton, who was the leader of uh, the uh, of People's Party too, was incredibly eloquent speaker. He ended up being shot by the police. Uh, and uh, who were up on roofs, on rooftops, uh, and shot him in the middle of the street. And um, there was also a major, a, an important uh, Mexican, and also Lee Otis Johnson, Lee Otis another Johnson, figure. Yeah. Yeah, I was uh, going to ask you both about Hampton and Lee Otis Johnson, because I would uh, see, you know, in the movement newspaper, which came out of San Francisco, right. it started as a SNCC newsletter and became an organizer's paper. I remember uh, it well. A lot of stories about the, the Carl Hampton and Lee Otis Johnson, and I was just wondering. Uh, I know Carl was killed, but what did what happened to Lee Otis Johnson? All right, Lee Otis Johnson was he was busted for for uh, passing a joint uh, to an undercover officer, I think it was, and passing a joint was counted as sale, and I think he got ten years, and um, he finally he he did finally get out, but he was just a changed. A changed man. He was never the same. Uh, it was it was a tragic situation. You know, you mentioned the Rainbow Coalition, which is something dear to our hearts here in Chicago. 
Uh, we had the Panthers, the Young Lords, uh, the Patriots, Rising Up Angry, the American Indian Movement. Uh, and it's a, you know, it's a concept that uh, is dear to, you know, close to my heart. And I'm just kind of, uh, you know, in a lot of ways, the country is divided into people who are open to the idea of America being a land of the free for everybody, you right. know, kind of a rainbow coalition versus uh, people who are really hostile to that and want just white supremacy. Uh, your take on that. Why do you think uh, uh, we haven't come further than we are now with people <laughs> that's the, and working together? <laughs> that's the big question. Yeah, you know, We've gone further apart in so many ways. Uh, I did want to mention, by the way, that the, when we talk, talked with Rainbow Coalition, the Mexican-American Youth Organization right. was a very, very strong, uh, strong group. And, and uh, uh, they took over a church and, and made it into a community center. And uh, so there was all kinds of stuff there. I don't know why we haven't gone any further. I don't know why we haven't. It's, it's, it's just a sad commentary on, on contemporary society and our culture. Yeah, it's uh, the, the right is powerful and they were creeping along all along. I keep thinking that we're kind of getting over the hump and things are gonna be good. You know, you elect Obama uh, and then we elect, you know, who and it's a kind of a mess. Let's go back in history one more time. You're in Houston, then you go to New York and you're working with the Liberation News Service. Why don't you, right. uh, as part of the talking about the underground press, uh, talk a little bit about the Liberation News Service and what it did and what it's, uh, maybe its legacy is for today. Okay, cool. Uh, first, there was the Underground Press Syndicate, uh, which was just a coalition of, of the first underground newspapers. Uh, and what they, what the Underground Press Syndicate did that was so important was they established that all underground papers would, sh would share uh, subscriptions with all the other underground newspapers so that we all knew what was going on all over the country and we all had to print print uh, boxes with with the names of all the papers and their addresses and stuff that was a lot of what the underground press syndicate did. then liberation news service was actually a news service uh, it it lasted a number of years it lasted in well into the 70s maybe into the 80s I don't know it, the name Ray that. Mungo just popped up in my head Ray Mungo um, was uh, Ray Mungo and Marshall Bloom, right. the people who founded Liberation News Service. Uh, and then there was a lot of controversy over time because they, uh, the staff kind of, the, Mungo and, and, and Bloom were both sort of individualists and didn't want to go with the movement really. And, and uh, uh, so the, they, the, the staff kind of took over or tried to take over and then Mungo and, 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 and Bloom and some other people came in in the middle of the night and took all the equipment, uh, took the printing press and moved it to a form in Massachusetts. Uh, right. And, uh, and so, uh, and we went and tried to get it back from them and, and there were charges filed and uh, uh, I was charged with disturbing the peace, I think, or something. Um, but uh, um, so, I mean, Liberation News Service was very important. It had a lot of very, very good people writing for it. They also reprinted a lot of material from the other underground newspapers. Uh, it was run by a collective, which Space City was too, by the way. Uh, Space City was run by a collective and it was half men and half women. And this was way back. Way back. So, and uh, so uh, LNS, you know, you had people, you had a lot of different kind of people that, that worked there. I worked there for, like I said, about a year. Uh, and uh, I worked with Alan Young, uh, you know, with, with Vic, Vicki Smith, who I mentioned before, who then came and worked with LNS. Lots of, lots of very, Abby Hoffman used to write for LNS. I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it was very important. They covered international stuff. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was, it's, it's not very well known. Um, uh, there's been a, a documentary in recent times that, by a woman named Dorothy Dickey about Liberation News Service, which just won a big award, uh, which uh, is, I, I was in, in fact, it starts out with RAG Radio. <laughs> That's the beginning of the thing. 
of the of the movie. But it's a it's a very good movie, and I highly recommend it to 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 everyone. It's called Under the Ground. Um, yeah, we'll have to look into that one. Uh, you yeah, know, you do this. Uh, I'm going to repeat. I don't know if I did already. You do your radio show at two o'clock Central Time um, uh, every Friday. Uh, but uh -huh. you also have a thing called the rag blog and uh, i want to thank you for encouraging me to do some writing when i uh, sold the heartland cafe um i sent you a picture i had a picture of some menominee indian boys at a uh at a, on a placard somewhere in wisconsin and you you asked me you said flesh it out a little bit and you ran the story the picture with a little story and that led to me doing i think 43 different pieces in the rag blog uh, and I, I'm stuck at 1984, but I, I want to ask your permission <laughs> to keep writing. And if I get it done, you'll keep publishing them. I will do so. <laughs> I will do so. The RAG blog, we had a reunion of the RAG uh, or the RAG staff in, uh, in, in uh, two, for, well, there were two of them, but the first one was in 2006 uh, or 2005. And all of these people from all over the world came to this, I mean, the, came to this reunion and out of that reunion developed not only renewed political activity, but we also started the rag blog. And the rag blog had a national and an international following. It's not, it's not, I don't publish as much now, but uh, it's, it's, it was very important. It was, there weren't all that many blogs and, and sites back then when we started, so. Yeah, so, um, well, I haven't written anything for you for a couple of years now, but right. it's, uh, it's the ragblog.com, uh, right? Right. It's right. really good for people. There's all kind of uh, stuff on there. We're going to run out of time. I'm going to ask you one more question. Uh, you've got a new book, a new project coming out. Uh, speaking of rag stuff, uh, it's called Making Waves, the Rag Radio Interviews. You want to give us a little hint about what people can look forward to? Sure, it's going to come out in June. It's published by uh, uh, the Briscoe Center for American History at the University of Texas. It's the UT Press, and it's got about twenty-one interviews that I've that I had done over the years on uh, on Rag Radio, and it's got a wonderful mixture: Dan Rather, uh, Paul Krasner, Bernadine Dorn, and, and Bill Ayers. Uh, uh, Bob Daddio Wade, the, the artist. I mean, it's a, it's a range of people. There's a lot of art. There's, there's musicians, uh, Ed Sanders. Uh, uh, and so it's, it's, it's I, I love it. I really like it. I think it all it came out very well, uh, but it, well, it won't be published until, until June. Well, we'll so be I don't looking know forward to that. And I just want to give people- One thing, let me tell people that, oh, go ahead. You may be saying what I was going to well, say. Well, I was going to just tell people that uh, one of the people that you've worked with over the years is Alice Embry. Absolutely. And, uh, we've got Alice's new book called Voice Lessons. And I, I've got a lot of books to read, but uh, Alice is going to be on the radio in the not too far off radio. And Great book. It's a great too. book. So okay. And if, if people are interested- say, if people are interested in finding space, exploring Space City, uh, you you can get it uh, on Amazon.com or on Lulu.com uh, or other bookstores and whatever. But uh, I'd love for people to get it just because I think what we did was very important in those days, and I think the paper was special. So well, please. you do inspire me to uh, you know I put out two papers, uh, the Rising Up Angry paper for a lot of years, and then. Uh, we did the Heartland Journal from 79 to 2005, and uh, this kind of thing that you did with this and also the one you did for the, uh, the RAG uh, really are inspirational, and uh, I'm sure that sometime uh, in the future, younger people will pick this stuff up and say, oh, wow, look, look what they did. Let's see if we can do some stuff like that and even better. Okay, Thorne, it's great to see you, and I'll be talking to great you next week. Great to see week. you. Okay. Great. All right, you are, listening. you are listening to the Live from the Heartland show. You might be watching it on YouTube. And uh, we're going to be right back with a couple of um, musicians. Uh, so we're going to play a little bit of uh, music from uh, Gerald McClendon and Vince Salerno from the album, album Blues from All Points. And this tune is Blues and Trouble. Take it away. Be right back. Stay tuned here on the left end of your dial. I'm gonna walk to the station with my suitcase in my hand. 
I'm gonna walk to the station with my suitcase in my hand. I'm gonna take that fast train all to that California land. Okay, welcome back to the Live from the Heartland show. I'm Michael James. This show is for the week of April 2nd in the year 2022. And um, we just heard as we were coming in the tune Blues and Trouble on the album Blues from All Points by two guys, Gerald McClendon and Vince Salerno. And they happen to be our next guests. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. I'm so glad that you uh, Nighthawks, you blues men, you R&B guys uh, are up so early in the morning. Uh, do this interview. Let's start off with, uh, you know, I've been listening to your music for the last couple of days since Lynn Orman turned me on to you and thought you'd be great guests on the show. Let me ask you how you met each other and what you do together. Can I answer that one? Because I, I remember this pretty strongly. Um, I got contacted from a friend of mine, a saxophone player that's a sub with a band called Public Eye. And I think this is around 1992 or 93, you know, and, and so I did the gig. It was a gig. Actually, Gerald, you picked me up, you know, at uh, where I was living on, on 7300 Ridge, you know, and we, I think we went to Michigan, something to do a wedding uh, in public. I was in an events band. So I, anyway, we went up there, did the gig, you know, and it was great. It was fun. Uh, it was all Motown, um, some, some other stuff. But uh, anyway, the next day, you know, like uh, my, my ex-wife <laughs> said, how did it go? And I said, it went really well. And I said, you know, and I, I met a singer I think I really would like to play with, you know. So, you know, that's, that's, that's how I met Gerald. You know? And Gerald, what do you remember about the early days of your union? Well, that's basically it. I mean, he, he put it in perspective. That's we uh, did this gig. And actually, the gig was in Iowa. But there's a funny Iowa? story. Yeah, a funny story okay. attached to it. It was kind of cold. And on the way back, we're driving. I had this big old Cadillac back then. Oh. We're driving. And, uh, <laughs> and so the window on, on Vince's side was down. And we're on the highway. And I'm thinking, man, we must either be hot or something's going on. I'm wondering why he won't pull up the window. Well, he's thinking, why won't I pull up the window? So we drove for miles. <laughs> <laughs> we yeah, yeah, I mean, we just met each other. We're just like, oh, okay. You know, I didn't want to offend him I'm or just anything. roll with that. So I don't even remember that. So how far back was this? When did you guys actually meet? And when did you first start uh, play, recording together? Okay, oh. well... All right. Well, like I said, it was around 92 or 93 that we played with with Public Eye, which was uh, you know, an events band. At, um, and uh, as far as recording with each other, that didn't come about until like three, four years ago when we actually started recording. Now, now we've done other things separate of each other, obviously. But as far as oh. recording Vince Salerno and Gerald McLennan, it was like... Uh, I think four years ago at this time, we did the first record, um, uh, Grabbing the Blues by the Horns. Uh, Gerald, tell me a little bit about yourself, about where you grew up and how you got into playing and who are your main influences? Oh, God. We don't have enough time for that. I know. Well, you've got <laughs> a, this is a challenge. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll cut it short. I, I grew up like South Side, West Side, um, so-called east side i grew up on every side where'd you and go to I high school i went to calumet high school uh -huh, okay south side in fact back then i was singing in the lunchroom with shaka khan and all people like that and hank renato domino went to my high school and back then i i he was like a little teen star i didn't like him <laughs> but we're friends now anyway <laughs> anyway no I, my influence is well, yeah, i listened to the record Record stores walking around in my neighborhoods and you know I just kind of listened to everyone and uh, got connected with R&B I really liked you know R&B and Smokey Robinson and the Temptations and Four Tops I listened to that a lot 
when I ended up on the north side, I started listening to rock and roll. I got into Jimi Hendrix and Led Zeppelin, and you know, I, and that the funny thing is, at the time I got into rock and roll, the funk was popular, like you know, on the south side in my neighborhoods, and so I kind of missed a lot of the funk because I was so into the rock and roll. And um, uh, then I got into the blues. I mean, so I just had a, a all different kinds of music always coming at me, but in my heart, I'm a soul singer. I gotta say. Uh, well, you actually go by the moniker the Soul Keeper. That's correct. And, uh, someone told me that uh, you got that name just fell from heaven and you came out of your mouth. Exactly. Uh, how did they, uh, <laughs> give me a little more detail on that? Uh, all right, all right. Now, I'm, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reveal the truth. Okay, I was watching The Matrix, and in the <laughs> Matrix, in the Matrix, there's the Key Keeper. And he, they're going through all these doors and this guy has a key to every freaking door that they need to get into. And he's got a <laughs> bunch of keys and I generally carry a bunch of keys. And uh, I just thought of it. I'm like, ah, key keeper. Well, what, what do I? And then I thought, well, I'm the soul keeper. I, I got all these soul tunes in my head. And it's like, there it is. Uh, let me shift back over to Vince. Uh, how okay. did you end up start playing? And uh what, who were your influences growing up? Some well, um, I I started playing in band in high school. Where uh, was that? Where was uh, that? Glenbrook South in Glenview. So I'm I'm a I'm a suburban kid. I it's okay. I we it. it's okay. <laughs> We're all humans. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So um, and uh, what, what happened was like um, like when I was a. I don't know. I mean, I, I kind of grew up on rock and roll, but the rock and roll that I liked was was blues oriented. Um, you know, I liked uh, the bluesy songs that Cream and the Doors were doing. Um, and then I heard the Paul Butterfield album, I think like when I was like 15 or 16 years old. And that just, you know, Sam Lay singing, I got my mojo work. And that just like said, wow, I got to check this out more. Um, and, and actually, when I was 16 years old, somehow I wound up on uh, the campus of University of Chicago and at a coffee house, Sam Lay was playing there with his band, you know, and, you know, they're doing blues. He had a harp player and I, and I was with my, one of my friends and I said, you know what, this is what I want to do. I want to play harmonica in a blues band, you know, and, and from that point on, I was a blues man. <laughs> well, I was, you know, when I was thinking about saxophones. Uh, yeah, no, I was already playing. But I didn't, um, I got to say for a first few years, I emphasized the harmonica playing more. But then like when I was like 19 years old, uh, I was already playing in the band and some of the guys were just saying like, oh, you know, you know, you got a saxophone. Yeah, I said, why don't you start bringing that and playing it, you know? And so I started playing on the R&B songs and, and the Chuck Berry stuff. And it, and it worked out really well. You know, the fact that I could, you know, the, I mean, the guys in the band helped uh, they appreciated, you know, the fact that I could uh, play both and we could do different styles of blues, you know, and uh, an r &B and b and Chuck Berry songs. So that's kind of how that started. Well, you're, you're bringing up a lot of memories for me. I remember going to the Sutherland Lounge and I'd seen Roland Kirk with all kind of, uh, you know, reed instruments. Yeah. And, and then uh, you mentioned Butterfield. I remember the, the Blue Flame at 39th and Drexel. And uh, he would play there and they would have a shake dancer, you know, they put a platform between the back bar and the bar and there's one more coming. I mean, for a young kid, it was pretty wild. You know, yeah, it was white just, kid hanging out at the Blue Flame in 39th and Drexel. Yeah, it was just Alvin Bishop, <laughs> Sam Lay, Paul Butterfield and uh, the bass player. Um, it was Billy Boy Arnold's brother, Jerome. That was like the basic band then. So, so I didn't guys, get to see them. You but, guys have a couple of albums out together. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about those albums. Uh, well, okay. I'm um, pretty much what happened was, was just like, like five years ago, I was talking to Tom Klein, the guitar player that, that's in Gerald's band. I was saying, you know, I, I would really like to do an album of, of material where I could get, you know, to play sax, the tenor sax, harmonica, baritone sax on it, and just do a really great R&B blues record, you know? 
and he got me in touch with Ellis Clark, you know, where we did the sessions at. I asked Gerald if he'd do it, and he, and he said, yeah, you know, let's do it. So uh, we made um, Grabbing the Blues by the Horns. Like uh, mm. we started working on it four years ago. Gerald sang on it's his voice that, you know, gives real authenticity to it. Uh, did you get a chance to hear that one? I'm not sure. I, the yeah. one that I listened to was basically Blues in Trouble, and then we got Hip City going out. Yeah. Okay. So that's I the tried second a bunch album. Of other get, but the get first old one, girls. the first one's, um, it, it's, it's more locked into like R&B and, and blues, whereas the, the new one, we did all kinds of styles, you know, and, and we also did some, uh, uh, I think four original songs, maybe five, four or five original songs on it. So, yeah. um, oh, there, there we go. Yeah, my screen blacked out for a second. So, I mean, that's how it came about. And I, I'm really thankful to, to Tom Linsk, you know, Tom Klein and, and Gerald for helping me do this. You know, but at the same time, I wanted to do stuff that, you know, that Gerald would fit into. And, and we did that. I, I'm, I'm proud of both records. And I'm, I'm just glad that, you know, Gerald was a part of it. And we're, we're looking forward, you know, to doing some more stuff in the future. Hey, Gerald, so, do you have records of your own out too? I did. And years, years ago, I, I, I wanted to be a recording artist. So I spent a uh, ton of money to do my first CD called Choose Love. Back then they had the old ADAP machines and, you know, it was like, it was hard to record back then because the new digital was coming in and the analog was going out and people were mixing them both. But anyway, I spent a ton of money and I loved my first CD. That was, uh, that was my project as Vince, you know, has kind of made this his project and recognizing that he, you know, put together a, a body of music well I did the same thing and they're all originals and then I got yeah it's a great up, album thank you man then I got picked up by uh another friend to do an album um and so I did this thing called um Mother Blues featuring Gerald McClendon and then I got picked up by Twist Turner to do a couple of tunes and they've gotten recognized you know uh, in the last uh, year, and I'm, actually, I'm receiving a reward for best blues and soul album by the Blues Foundation uh, coming up in May. Oh, so, great! Uh, That's good uh, to know. Yeah, man, I love to, to do the studio thing and the creativity. Uh, you know, it's really magic. You know. Well, but, I tell you, go ahead. You got any more you want to tell us? Well, just the fact that. Uh, well, the, the title of the, 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 the album that, that got recognized is called Let's Have a Party. And that's uh, uh, by the Blues Foundation, recognized as the, uh, well, nominated for one of the best blues and soul albums. Is that going to uh, be a public event? Yes, it's going to be in Memphis, uh, May the 5th. Um, it's going to be a big ordeal for me. But I come in there, you know, I mean, I've been doing this for a while. I feel like, you know, I feel, you know, like, wow, it's about time, you know, <laughs> in a way, you know, it's like, you know, when you, people tell their stories and they talk about all of the struggles and all the time they spent in the little bars and the bar mitzvahs and, the, you know, little house parties, backyard parties, I've done them all. So it's like kind of nice to be, at least get a nod, you know. Uh, oh, on, that's on great. The well, I think the two of you have a couple of, uh, I know you're playing, uh, today we're recording and you're playing somewhere tonight. The show is on tomorrow, but uh, I think you have a couple of gigs coming up in Chicago in the next couple of weeks. I, I got the calendar in front of me. So we're playing um, uh, April 9th at Untitled. We've been there for several years. It's one of Gerald's favorite rooms. We always have fun there. <laughs> Where's that at? We've got, Where's it at? Oh, uh, it's on Kinsey. Um, 111. 111. 111. That's right. It's uh, yeah, it's a speakeasy, but it's not. <laughs> uh, they, they they kind of market themselves that way. But you go down the stairs, and it, it's a really cool, beautiful. Venue. It's a good, beautiful place. It's a lot of fun. And then we got April sixteenth at the Foundation, um, and uh, Gerald could tell us a little bit about the Foundation. It's your friends, well, right? 
basically I know my my friend that told me about this place. It used to be an old rock and roll bar, and uh, this guy bought it and you know gutted it out. It was like a hole in the wall. Now it's like a very classy, nice place to visit and and have music. Uh, we're doing private. Uh, it's on uh, on West Irving Park, but we're doing a private party there on the. 16th. Oh, I made a mistake. I said sixteenth. It's the fifteenth. Yeah, it's but Friday. it's a private party. Oh, it's so a private I, party. Oh, yes, okay. It is. It is. Okay, but well, tonight I'm, is what's I'm tonight is going. what's important. Tonight is what's important is we're doing the venue uh, out in Aurora tonight, and that's going to yeah, be but fun. People won't know we're, about that till tomorrow. Yeah. So. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I missed that. One. I, will miss it, people. I was going to try to come to that private party, but maybe I'll go to the other one on Kinsey. I want to thank oh. both of you for coming on live from the heartland. Uh, tell us the name of the two albums that you got together again. And both the, I looked you both up on uh, the internet and I found information. So give us the albums again. Okay. The first one's called Grabbing the Blues by the Horns. The second one's Blues from All Points, and they're both on Chicago's Pravda music label. Pravda. It's Ken okay. Goodman. So, yeah, so it, a real record company. <laughs> and, and that's very cool. And I want to uh, just let you know that the album that I have been nominated for was done by uh, Twist Turner and myself. And uh, it's, been, uh, it's been a... Delta uh, Roots. Yeah, Delta Roots. Delta Roots. Delta yeah. Roots. Great albums. Yeah, we'll look forward to that. Okay, comrade brothers, I look forward to meeting you both in person. I love uh, I love your checkered shirt and I love your White Sox hat. Okay. A couple of handy cool. dudes. All right. All right, we're going to listen to Hip City with the two of you who are on that. One's playing the sax, one's doing the singing. And we'll be right back with more Live from the Heartland. Stay tuned here on the left end of your dial. And don't forget, you can always get it on youtube.com slash heartlandmedia. Be right back. Welcome back. Uh, we're here with the Live from the Heartland show, and we were just talking with Vince Salerno and Gerald McClendon and that tune that we went out of their segment with. And where we're at now is what's called Hip City. And uh, now we're going to do a little sports report. And uh, I've got two items. Uh, today is Friday, but we the show goes up on Saturday. And uh, Saturday is the big day for the NC2A Men's Basketball Final Four. I'm not sure about the women's uh, events, but we'll have that next week. Uh, the final four, we're going to see who will play each other for the championship game. At 5.10 on Central Daylight Time Saturday, first seed Kansas will play second seed Villanova. And in the second game of the last dance of the legendary NC2A coach, uh, Mike Shevsky, Mike, Mike Shevsky, I always have a hard time pronouncing his name. Um, he's a Chicago native and he's coaching the Duke Blue Devils and they're going up against their uh, in-state rival, North University of North Carolina. So it's a lot of basketball. We've been watching a lot of basketball, uh, still watching the Bulls. Uh, we'll, we'll know next week who the final four, uh, who's the final two. And on another note, we always bring up Colin Kaepernick not working yet or not having a job. Um, but we just found out that the University of Michigan football team has named Colin Kaepernick the honorary captain for uh, their maize and blue game, which I think is a game probably among their own team. But uh, he came in and he met with the team and uh, he's going to be the honorary captain and he deserves uh, at least a fair shake at getting a job in the NFL. So we'll see if that ever comes to be. Um, I have some sad news to report. Uh, when I went off to Berkeley in 1964 to be a graduate student, 
one of the first people I met at a reception of incoming uh, new graduate students in the sociology department, there was a fellow named Davey Wellman or David Wellman. And uh, he was the president of the Graduate Sociology Club and became my roommate for a year or so. We lived in Oakland together and uh, he passed away this past week. Um, he was a wonderful guy and uh, he came out of Michigan. His dad, Saul, had fought in the Spanish Civil War, uh, was, uh, I think, the leader of the Communist Party in Michigan. David was a, a political animal, uh, knew about racism early on. He hit me to a lot of stuff, was really my teacher. Uh, he did a, a number of uh, books, I think. Uh, one of them um, was called, I'm blocking the name of it. Where did I put it? Anyhow, that's what happens. Uh, Portraits of White Racism was his first book. He taught it, uh, I think, both Berkeley and at uh, Santa Cruz. Uh, we're going to miss you, Davey. You did good. And I want to uh, thank you for all the things that you taught me. Um, OK, uh, next week, we're going to have Mike Klonsky coming on. You know, he used to be on uh, Hitting Left with the Klonsky brothers on a uh, friendly neighbor station. Uh, that show is no longer on, but he has a new newsletter that he puts out, and he has all these kind of weekend updates and, you know, things that are going on in the world, and he's going to come on and talk about uh, city, world, state events, and his new project. Um, we're going to go out today with a little bit of music um, from Pastor T.L. Barrett and the Youth for Christ Choir. Uh, I picked it because it's a beautiful tune, um, and uh, usually Bob Maravich and Gospel Memories follows this show, uh, so we thought it would be appropriate. I don't know if Bob's there this week or not, but uh, we're going to listen to T.L. Barrett, uh, Like a Ship. And uh, for 25 years, we've been bringing you live from the heartland. Uh, it's on WLUW.org, WLUW887 on Saturdays. And then it goes to youtube.com slash Heartland Media. Uh, it's also on Can TV and Spotify and Google Podcasts. And we want to thank everyone who makes the show possible. Emilio Davis, uh, Katie Hogan, Lynn Orman Weiss, uh, Gwen Brown, and Luis Mejia Arends down in Veracruz. So all of you have a great week. Do good in the world. The world needs all the good that you do, that I do, that we do. All power to the people. See you next week. Thanks for tuning in. Over and out. Without a